Taking time out with PSOA. Sean Johnston here from Omaha, Nebraska with baseball training tape number four. Again, these training tapes through April are focusing on NFHS rules for NSAA baseball umpires and NHSOA umpires who are registered. We will go through a little word differences if there is conflict with other rule sets, just to clarify where confu confusion can come from, um, but make sure we're using the NFHS terminology um, during high school games. The main topic is interference. First one will be defensive interference, catcher. Then we'll go into offensive interference, the batter, the runner, team personnel. Umpire interference, the crew chief behind the catcher, the field umpire. Spectator interference, a person not inside the field. Follow through interference, which is an NFHS special terminology. Backswing with the batter. And then we will have a bonus one with coaches interference. Let's start with defensive interference. Catcher interference. In NFHS rules, this is called catcher's obstruction. This is a delay dead ball. Because if all runners, including the batter runner, do not advance one base award, the batter will be given first base. All other runners, one base, if forced by that batter runner becoming a runner. It's a delayed dead ball because we have to wait to see what happens at the result of the play when the ball's batted in fair territory. Swing and a miss, easy. Batter to first base. Foul ball, easy. Batter to first base. If we have a runner on third base, we have catcher's obstruction, fly ball to right field. That right fielder catches it. Runner on third tags, comes home, safe at home. We, as umpires, we enforce the catcher's obstruction. We would award the batter runner first base, and since the runner on third does not be forced home, we send him back to third base. So now the coach or captain can accept the result of the play. So they could come out and say, Sean, we want that run to score. That puts us up by one run. Excellent. They could take the result of the play. So now we go back, call the batter out, ignore the catcher's obstruction, have that runner from third score. Now the offense is happy. This is where it gets interesting. If now the defense appeals that that runner left early, the umpire calls that runner out, the offense can't go back to the catcher's obstruction. So once they make the choice, they can't change their choice. Now let's take a look at a couple more plays via video of what catcher's obstruction can look like. We're going to have a couple angles here. Batter swings, contacts the glove, and we have a foul ball. Since it's a foul ball, the ball is dead. We're going to award this batter first base due to catcher's obstruction as the batter during his swing to hit the pitch hits the catcher's glove. Time, catcher's obstruction, you, first base. Now the fun and interesting one. Offensive interference. Any act, physical or verbal, by the team at bat. So it's not just the runner, not just the batter, it is the whole entire team. And we'll go into what that means here in a little bit. But what the umpires have to judge, did the team at bat interfere with, obstruct, impede, hinder, confuse any fielder? Notice this is singular. When we talk about offensive interference on some plays, we're going to take a look at. We as umpires can only protect one fielder 
attempting to make a play. Umpires, as we go through these plays, imagine what you're going to tell a coach after you call offensive interference. And when you are practicing this, use the word interferes, obstructs, impedes, hinders, confuses. So some examples of what is interference. A batted ball hits a runner before passing the fielder. That's interference. That runner is out. Batter will be awarded first base. Runner blocks the vision of the fielder, and the fielder does not make the play. Time, offense and interference. Runner is out, impeding, hindering. Blocking the vision of a fielder. That runner's out. Batter, runner, first base. Offensive players. Yes, even those in the dugout. Saying, I got it. And then all of a sudden, that first baseman changes how they field that batted ball. That's offensive interference. That is the team at bat, and players did it. That batter is out. Offensive runner forces the fielder to change path to the batted ball because that fielder does not want to charge into the runner and make malicious contact. So they stop or they go around the runner. That's interference. Impedes and hinders. That runner's out. Batter runner gets first base. Any malicious contact by a runner anywhere on the field doesn't even have to be a batted ball. That's offensive interference. No runner will ever get a free shot at a defensive player. What is not offensive interference? A batted ball hits a runner after passing the fielder. So the infield is in, and the runner is behind the first baseman. If that first baseman dives, it passes him, then hits the runner, that's not offensive interference. Runner blocks the vision of the fielder. But the fielder fields the ball clean and gets the out. There was no hindering. All right, so when you're talking about vision, don't call it right away. Slow down. Make sure it hinders and impedes the fielder. And then if offensive runner runs well behind the fielder, runs well inside of the first baseman catching a f- fly ball, they could run anywhere to avoid offensive interference. I've said the penalty a couple times already, and we're going to take a look at video next. Ball is dead. Player who interfered all right, will be out. If it's not the batter, it's the teammates. The batter is out. If it's not the batter who's out, that batter, if it's a fair ball, is awarded first base. All other runners advance if forced. And if it's intentionally to break up a double play, so the runner is running and kicks the ball because they don't want the 6-4-3 double play. That can be judged intentional offensive interference. Runner and batter would be out. Base is loaded. Bam. Runner at second. Clearly hinders and impedes this third baseman fielding the batted ball. Remember, we're only protecting one fielder. In this play, the fielder we're protecting is the third baseman because in the umpire's judgment, this third baseman has the best opportunity to field this batted ball and get an out. Since this is bases loaded, time, this runner is out. Batter runner is given first base. That means the runner at first will be the second. This runner who started at third is not forced home Therefore, if this was not the third out of the inning, he would be returning back to third base. But this is a clear impeding, hindering the fielder. Number 16, R2, is out for offensive interference. Another fun one we run into, no pun intended, each game. Runner's lane interference. What is the rule? The runner must run inside the runner's lane during the last half distance. If they run outside, and outside is one foot completely outside of either line, 
they must have one foot on the line and the other foot in the lane. So one in, one out, illegal. One on the line, one in, legal. And this illegal action turns into a penalty when it impedes and hinders while the ball is being fielded or thrown. This is an NFHS, again, extension. If it impedes the catcher because they're going to throw it, but they're running illegally, so they don't make the throw, that's runner's lane interference. If it impedes the fielder receiving the throw, that's runner's lane interference. That runner must run inside this lane, one foot on, one foot in, in between the, the lines to be deemed legal. What's the penalty? Ball is dead, batter runner is out, and return runners to the base at the time of pitch. So this runner, who just potentially scored, if they scored, all right, runners lane interference, you would score the run because they already scored. This is called an intervening play. But this runner would be out. But let's say this runner wasn't coming home from third base. And they weren't going to come home until the throw was made. Since the play was not on the runner, this runner would be returned back to third base. We've talked about this in other shorts and other training videos. But the force play slide rule. So what is the rule? A runner forced to advance to avoid interference must slide straight to the base. Runner can slide away from the fielder. Or the runner can veer away from the fielder. So this picture right here, a slide and a legal slide is buttocks on the ground straight to the bag in Federation High School. Other rule sets, they can slide straight to and through, not in high school. They must slide to the bag and remain in contact with the bag. This is not a legal slide. Buttocks is not on the ground. If we have force play slide rule, the penalty. Ball is dead. Runner is out and batter runner is out. You return all runners to the base they were at at the time of pitch. So this is an obvious example of not sliding to the bag, but really hunting out that fielder. Umpires, remember, there's no judgment at first base. Do not turn your head when you have a force play slide rule interference. You don't want any retaliatory acts by the defense if there is contact. Get in there in between players and do not let things escalate. Next form of interference, umpire interference. If you're ever at one of our clinics and I ask you, face umpire, do you want to practice umpire interference? Do not say yes. Because rumor has it, I start hitting fungal balls at the umpires. So what is it? This is when a batted ball hits an umpire before the batted ball hits a fielder. The ball is dead, and the batter is awarded first base. All other runners advance if forced. So if it's just a runner at second, and the field umpire's in C position, gets hit with a ground ball, doesn't hit a fielder, we give the batter first base, we leave the runner at second at second base. What if it deflects off another fielder? Now the umpire is just part of the field of play. Ball is live, as in the batted ball did not hit the umpire. The deflected ball hit the umpire. Let's take a look at a play. Batted ball hits the umpire. Step on two, step on one. Wait a minute. It hit the pitcher and then the umpire. So this is a deflected ball. This is not umpire interference. Had this ball initially hit the umpire, and then we would have umpire interference, and we would award the batter runner first base, 
and the runner on first was forced to advance to second. This is a deflected ball, therefore the ball is live and in play. Force out at second, force out at first base. The second type of umpire interference is when the catcher attempts to make a play and the catcher contacts the umpire while attempting to make that play. Umpires, you are going to voice and point at yourself saying umpire interference. If the initial throw does not retire that runner, we call time. That's umpire interference and we send the runner back to the base they were at at the time of pitch. If the runner is out, that will nullify the act of umpire interference. We do not have to call time. All right, so a lot of times it's an inside pitch, and the catcher rears back, hits our chest, or hits our face mask. That's umpire interference. As soon as they make contact, umpire interference while pointing at yourself. The ball remains live until that initial throw does not retire the runner. Next one, spectator interference. This is an act by a spectator that impedes the game. So you have a ball going near a boundary line and the spectator reaches over onto the field. When this happens, we as umpires get umpire judgment is what it says in the rule book. And what that means is we get to enforce any penalty that would have nullified the interference. Let's take a look at a play from a major league game. We see the ball going towards the outfield fence and we see three fans near that wall. This is what we have to judge. Number one, is this fan reaching over into the field of play? If so, number two, did the fan touch the ball? Did the fan touch the player? Did the ball stay in the field of play? Did the ball leave the field of play? So a lot of stuff, us umpires, we would have to judge on this. The fan reaches over the fence, touches the ball. We would enforce the penalty of out, and that is a catch. If the fan touches the ball over the fence, by rule the ball becomes dead once it crosses the fence, we would rule a home run. Let's say the fielders are nowhere near this ball and able to make a catch. We would be able to judge spectator interference, change the directory. All right, so would the runner have only gotten a double? Would the runner have gotten a a double or a single or a triple a lot of things to go into play here all right so if you're watching this as a spectator you're in this position please help us umpires out this is a very difficult call to make if you stay back away from the fence now you won't have to worry about our judgment of where to place the runner or call the batter out this rule for nfhs backswing interference it's a different terminology for NFHS. For NFH, NFHS, high school baseball, backswing interference is when the batter contacts a catcher prior to the pitch. So the batter is just warming up, getting set, getting nice and comfortable in the batter's box. And they contact the catcher's glove. If this happens, there is no penalty. Umpires just call time. Make sure the catcher is good. Make sure the batter is good. And then put the ball back in play. All right, so backswing interference. The terminology for federation is prior to the pitch. Now, what causes confusion, what we're typically calling in other rule sets backswing interference, is follow-through interference in federation baseball. So... If the batter hits the catcher after the batter has swung at a pitch and that batter hinders the action at home plate or the catcher's attempt to make a play, during Federation, follow through interference. The ball is dead or delayed dead ball. 
All right, so if the catcher gets knocked out as knocked out cold, time. If the catcher's not able to hold on to the ball or get to the ball, time. But we're going to see a play here in a video. The catcher's actually able to play through the follow-through interference. And they do retire that runner on a stolen base. Now we have a delayed dead ball. The initial throw retired the runner. We're going to ignore the follow-through interference. So let's take a look at the, a, video, a couple videos of follow-through interference. All right, so the batter swings, hits the catcher's shin guard, and it affects his throw at second base. Again, if that catcher is not able to retire that runner on the initial throw, we got follow-through interference, return the runner back to first base. On this one, we don't have a runner advancing. We have a runner at first, but not advancing. Since the runner's not advancing, as soon as that follow-through hits the catcher, time, right away. There is no play going to go on, so let's just kill it. And then the last one. We do have a runner retired. So it gets hit in the helmet, runner's advancing, and we have an out. So since we have an out on the initial throw, we are going to ignore the follow-through interference. The last type of interference we're going to talk about today is coach's interference. No coach shall physically assist a runner during playing action. So for coach's interference, there has to be contact. All right, so in this still picture, we don't know if this is coach's interference or not. All right. But if this coach holds up their hands and that runner either contacts the coach's hands or the coach's hands contacts the runner, that is coach's interference. The ball remains live and the runner is out immediately. So as an umpire, all we are doing is we are pointing at the runner. We are stating, yelling, coach's interference, you, you're out but everything else remains live. Do not call time on coach's interference. Another time it does come up is a play at first base where there's an overthrow, and that base coach just barely touches and pushes that runner as in like taps him, go, 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 go. A tap is physically assisting a runner. So it doesn't have to be huge, a push, a shove, a, a grab. Any touch that tells that runner to go back or to go is coach's interference, point at the runner, coach's interference, you, you're out, and the ball remains live. Thank you for taking time out once again this week, um, participating in the topic interference. There's a lot of judgment that goes into interference. Umpires, remember, it is nothing until we call it something. Interference is very similar to a catch, to a tag, to a, to a foul ball. We could always go back to a dead ball time. So if you're judging, is it interference? Is it not interference? Judge that it's not. Let the play develop and then go back. Yes, that was interference. You, you're out. What we have coming up here Monday, April 8th in Omaha, Nebraska, we do have our first rules discussion meeting. Um, our goal is to bring umpires together. Um, we're going to be at DJ's Dugout, 114th and Miracle Hills, and we'll also be live on our YouTube channel underneath our live events. So if you're watching this video and you're not getting daily reminders of new quizzes, of new shorts, Make sure you scan this QR code, subscribe to it, and click the bell so you get reminders. About 10 minutes before that meeting starts, we'll have a reminder of a new meeting starting soon. I hope you could join us in the chat box. You could ask your questions, and we're going to go around the, the room with situations umpires experience during the first three weeks of the high school season. 
Thank you for taking time out with PSOA today. Until training tape number five next week, umpires, remember, you're only as good as your last one.